Hey everybody, welcome, welcome, welcome to December's episode of Wine Writers Wrap Up. It is a busy, busy time, but my friend Deb didn't let me stand alone. Not she is at all. here. <laughs> partners, partners in crime. Partners in crime to the very end, absolutely. So I Today is just something a little different. We're not really going to be talking about wine. I thought, you know, the year has sucked, right? 2020 was bad. Everybody was like, bring on 2021. And everybody thought, oh, you know, as if as if when the clock struck 12 and 2021 entered, everything was going to go away and it was going to be a great year. And it really still isn't. We still are having issues. We're still having, you know, more and more variants and I just need to laugh. I just totally need to laugh. So I oh, reached wow. out. Yeah, right? It, it, we need to laugh. So this is not about wine, this episode. This is just pure stupidity. Now, those of you who know, we are drinking wine. We are drinking wine. Um, so you know what? Let, let's get into that first step. What are you drinking? I'm drinking uh, Greek wine. Nice. It is 50% Astratico, 50% Mon Aveza. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's why you got the, the oops, the, <laughs> there you go. Um, it's Domain Sigala. All right. It is really nice. Nice, nice. Well, I am um, drinking San Simeon. And I am drinking mm-hmm. Viognier. Okay, so San Simeon Viognier. So, uh, oh yeah, well that is San Simeon. You know, uh, one of my favorite places to visit. Um, they have all of. Yeah, yeah, it's by like Hearst Castle. Actually, it is where Hearst Castle is and everything. Yeah. I just love it there. So beautiful. I get to see the. The I always confuse them. Sea lions, yeah. um, uh, and I I'm always a happy camper there. So that is what I am drinking because you know what I don't have a lot of Viognier and I love Viognier. So and you yeah. know what? I'm not thinking Viognier is a nice winter white. I agree because <laughs> it's got that that full bodiness. Yeah, yeah, and this does this has this has that glycerin in a Viognier Uh that I like. And I know that's one of those things about, um, you know, that is 50-50 kind of. People either like that in the wine or they don't like that in the wine, kind of like petrol and Riesling, right? right? Some people are like, yeah, bring me that, you know, bring me that petrol. Mm -hmm. And others like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go that route. But I, I'm a fan of the glycerin. And I'd say Greek wines, I've really seen them grow and mature. Um, in a good way. Yeah. Because years ago, I used to uh, do a wine tasting at the Greek church in Poughkeepsie. And, you know, I've seen them really, the quality of Greek wines has, has really progressed. This is a wonderful wine. I and love Astro Although the, um, Mon, the Monavesa is from the island of Palos. Oh, okay. But Astro okay. is from Santorini. Oh, okay. All right. It Does it say what the percentages are? 50-50. It is 50-50. Okay. But the I think you said that, yes. Yeah. stronger, so there's more citrus coming through, where um, the, I can't pronounce, the mon, monomavesa is more, I think, on the body and the structure and brings a little bit more tropical fruits um, oh. to it, where or, or tree fruits where the Astrotico is more lemon and lime. Like oh, okay. Lemon and lime. How's the acid on that? It's nice. It's not racy. Um, it's a good balance. It kind of tingles on the finish. Because yeah. Astrotico yeah. is kind of a high acid. Okay. But the other so one balances it out. Balances out. Very nice. And what, what's the alcohol on that? I think it's 14.5. Wow, that that can do some damage. Yeah. Oh well, I've got you beat. What do you got? Fourteen nine for a Viognier. Wow, it doesn't taste fourteen nine at all. Um, 
And again, that's what causes the damage. <laughs> now, you just don't think white wines have that, you know, I always think of white wines as, oh, it's an 11% alcohol, it's a 12% alcohol, you know, it's, you know. They, car they carry a punch. Yeah, they do. <laughs> they do, they do. So, all right, so we are going to get into what the episode is about, and Every year, there is something called the Darwin Awards, and I love the Darwin Awards for two reasons. One, I love Darwin. I mean, I love Darwin. I could have been his, like, research, you know, assistant or whatever. Just what he believes, how he proved things is just, you know, I'm a biologist. That's what I love, okay? I love genetics. I love evolution. It's to me, it's such a cool concept of how we got from, you know, from there to here, you know, and how we all evolved. And one of the favorite things that I like to say, and it is honestly perfect for right now, is as Darwin stated, it is survival of the fittest. Okay, so mm -hmm. you either need to adapt to the environment or the environment rules you out. Okay, so there's loads of things that we see there. Right now, there's a Red Bull commercial where I think there's two antelopes and a lion comes through the through the high grass, and the one antelope opens up a Red Bull, and the other antelope says, "Well, that's not going to make you outrun the lion." And the the antelope, first antelope says, "No, but it will make me able to run faster than you." Okay, so. Survive, faster antelopes are going to survive because they're not going to get attacked by the lions, okay? So these are the things that occur and divergent evolution and all of this. So I think it is hysterical. Now, the Darwin Awards, I do not know, poor research on my behalf, but I don't know when they actually started, but they've been around for quite some time. And they basically are the epitome of you can't fix stupid, right? <laughs> and for today's times, not to get too political, right? But in today's times, we have a lot of stupidity going on. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. There is a lot of stupidity going on. And as... As much as I hate to say there's people who are not stupid who are losing the battle with this, you know, virus, there's a lot of stupid people who are losing it and you just can't fix it, right? You can't fix it. And that's what the Darwin Awards is about, right? Can't fix stupid. So that's what the Darwin's Award is all about. So every year you get, they get nominations for people who have died in the stupidest ways possible. So one of the first ones that I had ever seen is, you, you have to feel bad, but one of the first ones I ever saw of the Darwin Awards was a veterinarian. So not a stupid individual, an intelligent individual. And this veterinarian died because the elephant he was taking care of was a little backed up. And so he was giving the elephant an enema. And the enema took effect a little faster than the vet thought he was going to take effect. And they later found the vet suffocated in a very large pile of elephant poo. And he was a Darwin winner. <laughs> Poor guy wasn't even allowed to receive his award. I know. <laughs> well, that's the thing. No Darwin Award winners are. Yeah. <laughs> they're all post uh, What is it? Post How do you say post humusly? Yeah, I know what you're saying. Humusly, right? So that was the very first Darwin Award that I have ever I had ever heard, and that brought my attention. So I thought it would be funny as we bring as we bring in the um, as we bring in the 2022, I think we need to do a little laughing. So I thought that we would bring up a couple of Darwin deaths. So the first one is the brainless bungee jumper. In 1997, 
Police in Reston, Virginia, issued a statement saying they had found a body of a 22-year-old Eric Barcia, who had apparently died attempting to bungee off a 70-foot bridge. Eschewing commercial bungee opportunities, Eric had happily taken matters into his own hands and tied several bungee cords together. He strapped himself on securely, tied the other end to the bridge, and jumped, confident in the knowledge that he'd carefully measured out the bungee's total length, just under 70 feet. Of course, he did forget the bungee's stretch. Splat. A big splat. A big splat. So, first of all, I... Tying bungees together is never a smart issue, right? You want a single bungee when you're doing this, but well, not not for jumping purposes. There's there's a reason why there's bungee cords, but right, <laughs> right, right, absolutely. So, can you imagine this guy? Right, he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm gonna go bungee jumping, and then kind of forgot that one major mm -hmm. thing. And he's lucky they held together. Right? That's what I'm saying. You don't tie bungee cords together. Because they're, they're you know, they're hooked. <laughs> I mean, so going down, yeah, but, you know, you go up and... <laughs> they unhook. Yeah, they can. <laughs> so you got to wonder, like, I, now, I, honestly, I have, ne I, would, I have never gone bungee jumping. I would love to go skydiving. But not bungee jumping. Bungee jumping, I think, is a bit too hard on my back. All I envision is my vertebrae. Either one. Uh, I'll go skydiving, but I won't go bungee jumping. I don't. I don't like that concept of dropping all the way down and then my spine go up, you know, as it's going on. But so, what do you think? A war? Should he have won the? Should he be a winner of the Darwin huh? Awards? You know what? You can't fix stupid, so. <laughs> I, th I think that's a good one. I think it's a good one. All right. Uh, a luckless sled neck. Ordinarily, a man killed by an avalanche is suffering from a natural disaster and not eligible for the Darwin Awards. But the circumstances surrounding the death of Walter, a 43-year-old Fairbanks man, an unusual enough to warrant an exception. He was killed not by the natural disaster, but by his own blatant stupidity. Um, Walter was high marking on his snowmobile. I don't know what high marking is. Um, this almost entirely pointless exercise involves driving as far as you can up a pristine slope before the sled gets stuck and then bombing back down again. Okay, I get that. Right? Okay, good. From a okay. fear's perspective, I get that. Right, so he's going up, he's gunning, he's gunning, gunning as a steep a slope as he can, and then ultimately the sled's like going to conk up out. To go back down. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. So state troopers had warned that conditions meant avalanches were likely earlier in the day. Walter had triggered an avalanche and had been buried up to his waist. Any normal person might be shaken up by this or the very least take it as a sign that they should stop. But this committed sled neck kept right on revving up and down the hillside until he triggered a second bigger avalanche which swept down and killed him. <laughs> so he survived one avalanche. So instead of sitting there, waist up in snow, waiting for help, he just, like, I'm going to get out of this. No, no, I think he got help. The the crew, that's a, that's what happened. He got help. So the the ski oh. patrol got him out, and then he went and did it again. Bad avalanche, you know, conditions, and you keep on going? <laughs> Hello? Oh, my goodness. Like, you know. Although, you know what, he might have thought in, you know, a, a sick sense that he could trigger the av avalanche and then do that flip thing and get down before 
Well, well probably that is exactly what he that's thought. That's probably oh, what his nice thought yeah. was. Or he thought I already did one award. I already did one avalanche. So I'm not going to – there can't be two avalanches in a day. <laughs> I don't know. That's kind of equi- – that's almost equivalent to the, the poop vet. <laughs> <laughs> I think Although I – I think that was dumb luck on his part. He he just get his hand out and cried. <laughs> I was say I think I'd rather be buried alive. I'm not even gonna go there, but <laughs> I think I'd rather be very. I think I'd rather be buried alive in snow than yeah, an elephant poop. <laughs> elephant dung. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this one um, was, now you would think an airborne officer needs a little intelligence, right? You can't okay. be an airborne officer with, you know, being What's low on that. Officer? Uh, you know, like an, uh, an uh, air, like a petty officer in the Air Force. Okay, okay, gotcha. Okay, so this guy here. Brandon Dilbert of the United States Navy. All right, uh, out. Dilbert. That well, means. actually, it does say it actually does say it's a pseudonym. They kept his name private, which um, I think goes against I think goes against the rules of Darwin uh, okay. Darwin Awards. But um, so he was a uh, in the Navy, and uh, he. Well, he lost his life while in service to his country and is officially honored with the full respect due to a fallen hero. And literally, he fell. Because he was trying to Superman out of the naval helicopter while it was flying in the air. <laughs> okay. So what is Supermaning? <laughs> no parachute, no nothing. No. So what is supermaning? You know how those helicopters in the in the military open up the back so mm-hmm. things can go out the back, right? So supermaning had recently like been invented down down the chute. Like what? Arms out. Yeah, arms, arms out down the chute. Yes. Okay. So, supermanning had been recently invented by certain troops goofing off in, in the aircraft. Um, so, uh, Petty Officer Dilbert, uh, basically what they do is they tie themselves to the helicopter. And then as the ramp goes down, right, they lie themselves out. So, their feet are still in contact with the ramp. And then they lower themselves so that they are parallel to the ground below them, right? So they're harnessed, Mm -hmm. attached to the helicopter, and then they lower themselves down and they act like they're flying out of the back of the helicopter. All right? So you got got that image? Got that image. Okay. All right. So... Dilbert here made his makeshift harness to defeat the supernaturally strong winds, and he, of course, in today's world, was on social media showing him supermanning. Okay? So he was on an MH-53, which apparently is the largest helicopter in the United States, and was traveling at a speed of 138 miles per hour carrying 52 troops uh, 52 troops or 36,000 pounds of cargo so That's a lot of it, weight. yeah I think yeah oh. so petty officer Brandon strapped a 10 foot belt under his shoulders and slowly low, let himself out over the edge of the cargo ramp while fellow crew Cruz taped winning photos of his antics. With his iron grip did slip and the full weight of his body was briefly held by the loose harness, 
which then soon slipped from under his arms off his shoulders, sending him falling down 120 feet, 125 feet into the Persian Gulf. So he was holding on to the hardest. They were videoing him for social media. He gave a thumbs up, which made him let go of the harness that he was held on to. And he fell 125 feet. That's not very far, though, is it? Well, you drop 125 feet and see if you survive. I don't know. I, I, I... You figure a story is nine feet, what? Right, a story, uh, uh, each okay. level in a building. Right, so it is pretty far. Is. <laughs> right. Pretty far. <laughs> You're looking at, you know, quite a high I, building. But you know what? I think that's just pure stupidity. Well, yes, yes, because uh, it's social media. Yeah, yeah, He's, and and you know what? It, it's one thing like. The vet with the elephant poop. Yeah. That's you know, just kind of sad, ironic. Yeah. Yeah. But when you're doing a stunt, this, and this is my opinion only, okay? You're doing a stunt, and you're doing a stunt to possibly get on social media, and maybe the bungee guy was doing the same thing. Should you get a Darwin Award? No, because it's stupidity. What the vet was doing was, Performing a procedure on an animal. Right. He that's shouldn't get the Darwin. He shouldn't have won the award. And, and the animal let loose before he could remove yeah. everything. Right. Yes. He needs the Darwin Award. No, 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 no. It's, I think it's the other way around. He wasn't stupid. Darwin is ruling out oh. stupidity. <laughs> I have a hard time getting my head around it. But for the people that are just like, you know, this guy doing it for the social media thing? He's a Darwin winner. Yes, he's he a, is Darwin a Darwin winner. So okay, this, got it. you got to be stupid to win the Darwin. To figure okay. things out. But, so, you know, bungee guy too, you know? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> hello? You never use bungee cord much, but I know how to use a bungee cord. But, <laughs> and you know. you know it stretches. You yeah. know it stretches. I know it interlocks, and then I know it can also up interlock. So here's the thing, and again, not to be political, but he did get, um, it was ruled an accident, and it was ruled a death in the line of duty. So he actually is part of the American heroes who lost their lives during the Iraq war. Um, we don't want to go political, so I'm not even going to. Yeah, that one's a little, that one's, oh. you know, because, and I, and I get, yeah, you want to do fun things, whether they're stupid, whatever. We've all been there, and we're all going to all continue to be there. Even when I'm in my 80s, I'm going to be doing stuff if I live that long. To be. <laughs> but should he get an honor for it? No, I don't think so. Yeah, no, no. Sorry. All right, here we go. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the YouTube para plunger in uh, a para a paraglider named Craig from Riverton in Utah decided he'd try out a new soft way of landing and splashed down in a canal. The first part went swimmingly with Craig ex executing a perfect landing. Unfortunately, the swimming part didn't go quite so well as Craig's parachute filled with water and dragged him downstream and drowned him. So he parachuted into a stream. It, right, because there was no way to de detach his parachute. Right, so he, para he, he parasailed, and when you land, right, it's a hard right. landing, right? 
So he I, thought I, he would land. He thought he would land softer in the water. <laughs> but I see his parachute probably got under him and then dragged him down. <laughs> but where was it? It was a good thought. <laughs> where was his rescue boat or whatever? Um, I guess he didn't think that all the way through. I'm thinking he's one of those people, you know, um, that just jump off a cliff and throw out their own parachute type thing. Yeah. You yeah. know, those people, they don't have, you know, I'm guessing he's the one of those people. The little thing that you push, you know, when you were... Yeah. There. Yeah. Yeah, like the little army dude. <laughs> that always got wrapped up in his own parachute. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I wonder how many people listening actually know what we're talking about. <laughs> that was always a stocking stuffer. That was like, <laughs> right? You had to take, you had to take the parachute and puncture the little holes, right? And then take the little tiny thread and put it in there. Then tie it to the little army dude, yep. and then you throw it up in the air, and, and one out of yeah. <laughs> One out of 20 times. <laughs> oh, childhood memories. Uh, you know what I saw in this? You know what I saw in the store today? What? A slinky. Really? Yes, a slinky. Yeah, they sell them at Walmart. Do they? Yeah, because Paul bought them to keep um, Bob out of our awning. Because he read, if he put a slinky in the awning, Bob, who's our resident, um, I think it's a sparrow, kept yes. taking nest in the awning, and then that didn't stop him, and then he had to put Brillo up there. Still oh. up there. Oh. But the slinkies at um, Walmart, they were $7. Oh, uh, well, I was at the Dollar General, which, oh. by the way, no longer a dollar. Everything's a dollar twenty-five now. Well, you know what's there for the slinkies? But it didn't matter. Bob is still a resident. Bob found his way around the slinky. Yeah, sparrows are pretty pretty smart. They're actually like kind of uh, parasitic birds. Yeah, his whole family yeah. comes. His offspring. <laughs> yeah, we have like yeah, it's it's, it's quite a party. <laughs> <laughs> well, now they have a slinky, so it's a true party. <laughs> All right. Well, since we talked about the the paraplunger, we have a cliff diver. Okay. Who has won the award? So, um, this 27 year old met his untimely demise at Shrinkle Haven in Wales. In an apparent attempt to impress a group of teenage boys, the man dove off an 80-foot cliff into the water. If done properly, an 80-foot cliff dive shouldn't be fatal, but it appears the man had zero prior experience of high diving. He was knocked unconscious by the water, and although the teenagers climbed down and fished him out, he was proclaimed dead on arrival. <laughs> That's sad, because it was probably a life dream he had. <laughs> <laughs> that or he would drink too much wine or something. Maybe. Day. Although maybe if he had wine, he wouldn't have hit his head. I don't... Well, maybe he. I. I. I don't. I don't want to say I don't know how to dive. I know okay. how to dive, but I have a hard time keeping my chin to my chest. So maybe oh, okay. that happened to him. Maybe. Maybe, but 80 feet, you have to make sure that your hands are above your head to cut through the water, like the surface. Okay, he might yeah. have up. He might have looked up. Yeah. That's an issue with me. That's why I don't dive. <laughs> I used to dive as, as, a, as a youngin. I used to dive. I have several trophies for top dives. I loved diving. Diving and swimming kind of go hand in hand. Yeah, not uh -huh. much stuff. No. <laughs> All right. In honor of my dad and my brother who are electricians, we have an electrician Darwin winner. So this guy here, um, 
the hapless individual was a man named Rodney who was happily doing laps of Lake Washington when he realized his oh I already know where this is going <laughs> when he realized his battery was running a bit low pulling up toward the shore he moored his jet ski and ran to get a set of jump leads. He plugged the ends into a 110 volt outlet, ran down to the water's edge, carrying the, the clips, you know, the red and black clips. Unfortunately, he didn't stop at the edge and plunged straight into electrocuting himself instantly. <laughs> How did you do that? He was running in water when he connected the the jump cables. <laughs> That's in water. That's like 101. <laughs> Poor guy. He was in water. <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious. Oh, my God. I would like to think my parent, my father and brother would never, ever do that. <laughs> Uh, all right, let's see. What? what? Electricity and water don't mix. That's they like, do not. That, like in grade school about, you know, electric storms, you know, thunderstorms. And... Yep, yep. Wow. Maybe he missed, maybe he missed that day. Oh, uh, yeah, he was, he was absent. This <laughs> <laughs> playing with his bungee cords. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. All right. This is a 2020 winner. Okay. okay that's last year. Yeah, so this is last year's winner. Um, this is, I'm going to read you how they wrote it because this person actually wrote a pretty funny story or way to write it. Hands are numb. Oh, by the way, this is in Japan. Okay. okay. Hands are numb but must operate smartphone, muttered 47-year-old Ted Zhu to his live stream audience as he skidded and stumbled up the snow-covered Shubashiri Trail of Mount Fuji. I wish I had brought heat packs, he lamented, and then he was heard to say, wait, I think I'm slipping. 62 miles west of Tokyo, iconic Mount Fuji is one of Japan's three holy mountains. A 12,389-foot volcanic summit visited by religious pilgrims, mountain climbers, and sightseers, the trek is cold and slippery even during the brief summer season when amenity stations are staffed and available for the benefit of climbers. In the off-season, the stations are closed and mountain conditions are downright hostile and inhospitable. A winter climber needs a proper gear, climbing experience, and a booster pack of common sense. Tedzu lacked all three. <laughs> Wearing street clothes suitable for a typical October day in Tokyo and carrying nothing more than a pair of climbing poles, Tedzu fired up his smartphone and proceeded up the Shubashiri Trail, which incidentally most climbers use only for descent. Live streaming for the Nico Nico video sharing platform, he entitles his video, Let's Go to, Snow to Snowy Mount Fuji. In hindsight, the title implies that Tedzu considered Snowy Mount Fuji a safe as a ski resort or Christmas tree farm. Viewers, of course, began to view in. Following his happy jaunt up the ash-covered trail, ashes soon turned to snow and then to deep snow. Tedzu's viewers were now being treated to a litany of complaints about cold, numb hands and a bitter lack of hot packs. Those watching might have started to feel a bit bad for Tedzu. This was a very good time for him to turn back and resume a life of relative anon anonymity. A turning point, as it were, but he was on social media. They urged him to continue, and of course, he continued. <laughs> Continuing his social media commentary as he 
juggles climbing poles and smartphone in his frostbite mitts, Tedzu demonstrates a classic case of misplaced priorities when he states that despite numb extremities, he must continue for social media. <laughs> his viewers no doubt noticed that the fence has ended and he is perilously close to the brink. He has now passed the point of no return. There is absolutely nothing his viewers could do except tune out and disbelieve. Bullshit. They were all tuning in because that's how our society works, you know. Yeah. You know they were watching him. Oh, this place is slippery, getting dangerous, he belatedly notices. I'm trying to walk by the rocks. Yes, rocks. It's steep. Does his audience hear reassuring sounds of of him gripping the ice as he continues past the end of safety fence into uncertain territory? Nope. He didn't grab the crampons. The slope at that point, because he didn't have any. <laughs> the slope at that point is 30 degrees, as anyone still watching could see. In his continued play-by-play -play march along an increasingly risky path, Tedzu frequently cautions himself against falling. Some of his viewers might have given Rai chuckle as his sudden realization of what had gotten himself into. His inappropriate fruit footwear now failing him, he trips, stumbles. More than once, he asks himself whether or not he's on the right track. Astonishingly close to the summit for an amateur winter hiker, Tedzu at last utters the anticlimactic words, Wait, I'm slipping. Experienced Mount Fuji climbers say, if you start slipping, you have one chance at self-arrest before it's too late, even now. Tedzu might drop his phone and jab his climbing poles into the ground, but no, he cannot drop his phone. His smartphone is way too important, and he is way too intelligent. Still live streaming. <laughs> Viewers are treated to a spectacle of feet flailing and poles tumbling free. A few seconds later, the phone footage abruptly stops. The final chilling image shows a climbing pole frozen in mid-flight. That's really sad. <laughs> I mean, but he obviously has something to prove. To who? To the people on the other side of the phone. Right. Well, Which that's all really, you know, it, it, it's really sad when, and you don't know who's turning in and what, you know, oh, yeah, go, 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 oh, look at, it. Look at this jerk, you yep. know, and, and, and now that costs a life, and he was probably, he was somebody's child, he was somebody's son, he might have been somebody's uh, husband, he might have been a father, you don't know. That's true, but you kind of, I mean, I'll be the mean one kind of hope that that stupidity gene stopped with there. Oh, my God. But, yeah, it's like, hello? And then, <laughs> if you're going to go do something like that, you got to research it. Yeah, that's not something you just kind of go, go and do. But apparently he made it somewhat close. He made it rather far. And he will now live in infamy as a Darwin a winner. Word winner. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you, just, you know, you just gotta shake your head sometimes. Like, hello. <laughs> I, I actually been doing that a lot lately, but I know. Yeah. I know. Sadly, I'm I'm seeing more of the need to head shake lately than for other things. Yes. Like really. Yes. yes. Well, I'm gonna add one last story. And just because I think it is a hysterical one, and it has a little twist to it. Uh, so another Darwin winner was a thief who was trying to break into a home. And what he did was he tried to get in through the garage door. Okay. So what he did some research, so he, he was kind of paying attention, and he waited for this couple to leave for, I guess, their date night or whatever. And when they left, he stopped the garage door or apparently somehow stopped the garage door from closing all the way. And he, on his stomach, trying to shimmy his way into the garage. Well, 
in the process of shimmying his way into the garage, he, like, knocked the laser or something. I don't know how that all works. But the thing that tells the garage door to stop going down because something is in its way mm -hmm. did not work. So the garage door just kept coming down and then just kept coming down and kept coming down and kept coming down. So after the lovely date night that this couple had, they arrived home and as they pulled into their driveway and pushed their garage door opener, it did not open because eventually it all like shut down or however because of the power. And what they found was legs sticking out of their garage door. <laughs> kind of like the Wicked Witch of the West. Exactly, exactly. So they find these legs sticking out. They go in. They somehow open the garage door. They find the other half of the man in the, gar in the garage, and they call the police. This is a Darwin nominee. He did not win. But he was a nominee. So. That is the I can't fix stupid. <laughs> I mean, are, you know, are you kidding me? You go, you're going to rob a place and <laughs> stuck in a garage? I, I would love to be the person to drive up and see that happen to somebody. I wouldn't want to be in that situation, but I want to see it. But So this is the little twist. The person did pass away so sad but his own stupidity led him to that um, but his family sued the homeowners no way they did I hope they didn't win they did how they said that the the garage door shouldn't should have if it was incorrectly or you know manufacturer whatever that um, it should have stopped right the whole idea of a garage door right if you run through a garage door right. as it's closing it, it stops he was trying to rob the house that's our society oh man there's something wrong with that so he is a Darwin nominee I'm not sure if he won or not uh, but he is a Darwin nominee, and he, um, his family won lots and lots and lots of money from uh, the homeowners and, I believe, the garage door people. Because you always do the big people, right? That's what you do in today's world, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. It is a free society. So, I mean, kind of, kind of, how funny would that be? You come home and you see the Wicked Witch of the West right there. <laughs> I'm like envisioning that in my head. Or house. east, whichever one, whichever one died. Which one died? No, the West is the right. The Wicked West of the the Wicked the Witch of the West. West. She's the one who lived, right? She's the green one, right? Yeah. It was the East. I thought, I thought mm. it was the Wicked Witch of the West that died. That died. So who's the green one? That's, you know, I always wanted to go see Wicked in Broadway. And I've seen it three times, I, and I still really? can't answer the question. I always wanted to, and every year I would come home, I want to go see Wicked, I want to see Wicked in Broadway. You think he'd go buy me tickets? <laughs> I think the Wicked Witch of the East is the one who died, and the Wicked Witch of the West is the one who havocs Dorothy, I think. But we'll have to, anybody who's listening to this, yes. Shoot us an email. Shoot us a thing on social media. Let us know which is the witch that died. Because it's the Wicked Witch of the West, and then there was the, I want to say Esmeralda, but that's not her name, but the, the Good Witch. No, I think it's, oh, I don't know. No, Esmeralda is the, is the aunt on Bewitched. <laughs> I don't know. It could be the Wicked Witch. It could be, it could be the Witch of the, Glenda. Glenda, Glenda, the good witch of the north. Yes, Glenda's the good witch. Of the north. I'm telling you, I think the witch that got run over by the house is the wicked witch of the east. Because it was the west, it was the west oh, yeah. sister. Is it the west or is it the east? And who's got the answer? There we go. We'll go with that. We'll go. <laughs> I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to Google that when we get off. 
and I'm going to let you know. I think that I think the East died and the West is the green one. That's my thought. <laughs> I think it's the other way around, but I think. All right. Well, I don't want to do it rich, though. No, because they were the wicked witch, the wicked witch, ding dong, the wicked witch is dead. Glinda's a good witch, but we never saw a witch of the south. Right? Glinda didn't ever talk about a witch of the south. I didn't see the play. No, but you watch Wizard of Oz. Yeah, yeah. Glinda is the good witch of the north. Okay. So she's, there's got to be a witch of the south, you got to figure. All right, we're reading too much into it. <laughs> All right. All right, Deb, I have a get I have a riddle for you. Oh my god, I suck at riddles. <laughs> I think you're going to get this one. I doubt it. Okay, I think you're going to get it. Okay? 5 pieces of coal, a carrot and a hat were lying in a garden. Nobody put them there. But there's a logical reason why they were there. What is it? A snowman. Yay! I can't believe. I mean, I'm catching on. I'm not good at riddles, but I'm catching on. <laughs> frosty. See? It's frosty. It was frosty. It but was. But actually, I've been watching on TV. There's that commercial where the girl has the snowman, she makes the snowman, and I don't know if it's her brother or her neighbor comes and takes, tears the snowman apart, and she comes running out of the house, and she takes the, the what snowman inside, puts it in the freezer, and it lasts through the summer and everything. And back outside in the winter, and then somebody comes and bikes through it, and then they all build a new one. Oh, my God. What the hell is that for? I, I don't... I, I, I don't even remember what the commercial's for. I've seen it on um, football, when I watch football. Oh. Hmm. All right. So. I'm going to have to watch that. That that sounds like a psychotic commercial. He <laughs> <laughs> saves that snowman. <laughs> All right, Deb. I know you have some stuff up and coming. So what are you doing to keep yourself busy? Because I know you are like me and cannot sit still. So what's, no, what are I you up to? Still. So I'm Debbie Giaquindo. I'm a Hudson Valley wine goddess. And I'm a wine blogger, wine writer, wine educator. And I also own a restaurant in North Wildwood, New Jersey called Trio North Wildwood. And we have a great New Year's Eve dinner planned for everybody. Um, we're going to have champagne, I don't want champagne toast, but a sparkling wine toast for everybody that comes in and dines with us that night. And actually tomorrow night I am doing a wine tasting at End of the Road Theater. Uh, we are watching um, Bottle Shock and we're going to taste uh, two Chardonnays, uh, a French Chardonnay, a California Chardonnay, a um, Burgundy Sauvignon Blanc because there is a region in Burgundy that just produces Sauvignon Blanc and a California Sauvignon Blanc. And then we're going to taste the Montalion, Chateau Montalion uh, Chardonnay. And then the restaurant is going to be closed for three months, and I'm going to be concentrating more on my wine writing and possibly coming out to visit Lori. And people like getting in some trouble in California. And... Uh, you just never know, but I'm going to have some nice downtime, and um, I also have to go wedding dress shopping for my daughter because she's getting married next year. So uh, I think that's it. Lots of stuff guys. happening. You know, I'm author of a book called Tapping the Hudson Valley, <laughs> the weekend itinerary visiting the Hudson Valley area, and just Google me if I forgot anything. It'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm... I am kind of upset that I'm not in the area to go to the movie and wine pairing thing. Like, I think that is such a cool concept. I absolutely love it. Um, and I there's I actually brought this concept up uh, to Nick Berube, who has been ghosting me. <laughs> well, he... He's uh, got other stuff going on now, but I want to do a I want to do a watch a movie 
and just like uh you know what is that that show uh uh, where it's like the robots watching the film, the Mystery Theater 3000, or okay. right, where they just watch a movie and they talk throughout the whole movie, making fun of the movie. That's what I want to do. I want to I want to watch a movie and totally make fun of it throughout the entire movie, um, which will make for a very long podcast. But we can break it up into three different podcasts. So that's that's what's in the agenda in the future. Um, I think it is Mystery Science Theater 3000 is what is the show that actually does it. Um, but that's what's in the future. So that will be a new thing coming up for Exploring the Wine Class in the future. <laughs> but anyways, thank you, Deb, for joining me. And thank oh, you for allowing me to laugh at some stupidity in the world because I think we all need to laugh at stupidity in the world. We do. And you know what? In this day and age, you have to laugh. Absolutely. You know, it, it's just a, a way to get through everything. I agree. I concur. Yeah. And Darwin was a very smart man. And one of these days, I'm going to get to the Galapagos Islands and... I'm going to be the happiest camper on the face of the earth. But in the meantime, we will just have to drink. Cheers. So, slancha. Happy holidays. Happy holidays.